Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Certainly glad you're here this week rather than last week. Speaking of weeks and things going on, church council's taken out an insurance policy to keep the snow away from us this coming Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, we're expecting 12 to 20 inches or whatever it is. And so church council has postponed their meeting on Thursday night. So we'll probably get a half an inch. So thank church council members when you see it. <laughs> Uh, a few announcements. First of all, we have year end statements sitting back here behind Dale and C. Bell. Uh, I, I saw seeing some people running around, scurrying around, handing out envelopes. So please pick those up today and save shirts and posters if you would, including those of service. Uh, a reminder that our annual meeting takes place on the 13th of February after the worship service, so please plan on that. We have two care cards back here at this table one for Bill Bradley and one for Don Olson, so please take the opportunity to sign those cards today as well. And of course, we uh, send our sympathies to David and Rita Deutsch uh, on the death of his brother, Lee Deutsch, uh, who passed away on the 22nd, and uh, so we want to remember them. Also, in our prayer concerns, uh, we want to remember James Brink, Ron Carter, Paul, and Peter Dean. Of course, David Deutsch, who's at, still at Shirley Ryan, the Bellamy Center, and in Chicago, William Griffin, Tara Jean Brink Jackman, uh, Shirley Curley, Tom Kurgan, Beth Larson, Ryder Lumen, Carol Mady, and Kat, Kathy Mombrum, uh, Kristen Nickerson, Nancy Reeker, Sue Regal, Adam Salerno, Keith Sunder, Jim Tower, and Ann Washburn, and Larry Young would add to our list for prayers. And also, we had this morning Jenny Towery, who is Marsha Deshawn's niece. So please remember all those folks and also the military personnel in your prayers. Are there other joys, concerns, or announcements to share with the body this morning, Bruce? Prayers for Jack Kittersonke, which is probably the most different. Oh, Jack Kittersonke. Prayers for Jack Kittersonke in Florida is having trouble with double vision. Okay, thank you. Others? Yes, Plenner. I just want to say, I won't delay it as long as I did get any money on it. <laughs> <laughs> he said he wouldn't delay it as long as he did the last time. <laughs> I know that all of you know now, it was me who made a poor decision. Part, I take full responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's the other side of that silver dollar, and that is all the males and females that came forth to support me that day to get me into church to make sure I stayed and they could observe me for another hour make sure I was doing okay and I got people calling me the after church and the next week and the following week so I am extremely thankful for that and it is with gratitude and thank this from the bottom of my heart to all of you. I will never forget it. It was a, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Tom, I think Leonard was trying to get out of me being a liturgist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Peter, Peter was going to be the lay liturgist for that Sunday for the first time ever. So he was just trying to help Peter out, but Peter didn't want to do it anyway. <laughs> Took the pressure off, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Are there other joys, concerns, or announcements? Hearing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship God with the singing of our song of preparation. called us to share the good news of God's love. But who am I that God should call me? You are a beloved child of God. But I am weak. I'm not a great speaker or preacher. God is with you. Don't be afraid. Lord, help me to trust in your presence with me. Help me to serve you. Can we join together in our opening prayer? 
Gracious God, you come to you this day, seeking your guidance and strength. You have called us to ministries for which we feel inadequate. Help us to understand that it is in your love that you will support and sustain our efforts. Give us the courage to place our trust in your abiding presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now join together in singing our opening hymn, and with those who are able, please rise. Even before we were born, God knew us. God has always been with us. Place your trust in God's presence and forgiving love. Rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ. We are all forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Our Hebrew Bible lesson this morning is from the first chapter of Jeremiah, verses 4 through 10. After years from stray, of straying from God's ways, King Josiah guided the people back to godliness with Jeremiah's help. God speaks to the prophet. Since before he was born, God has known him intimately and has dedicated him to his service. He will support him in this ministry despite his youth and experience and apparent lack of authority. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand, and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And our epistle lessons from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Paul has further instructed the Christians at Corinth about the gifts of the Spirit, telling them that three groups of gifted people are especially important, namely apostles who spread the good news, prophets who tell of new insights into the faith, and teachers of the faith. Now he says that the most important is love, the expression in the community of God, Christ's love for us. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophecy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. And our gospel lesson is from the fourth chapter of Luke. Jesus attends the synagogue service on the Sabbath. He has just read some verses from Isaiah. He now tells worshipers that he fulfills them. He is the expected Messiah. He will rescue all those who are in need. God's promises made to Israel are fulfilled in the new age. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that you have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, 
No prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except for the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There are also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them were cleansed except for Naaman of the Syrians. When they heard this, all of the synagogue were fulfilled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the bow of the hill on which the town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Thank you, George. Let us now be the church in prayer. Oh God, your love is patient. We give you thanks for all those who have been patient with us, teaching us and caring for us in so many ways. We pray for the patience to love others as you have loved us. Oh God, your love is kind. Thank you for every unexpected gesture of kindness we have received. Give us the courage to be kind to others, serving those who seem unkind, rude, or difficult to love in these difficult days. Remind us that each one we meet is your child, our sister or brother, made in your image. O oh God, your love is not arrogant. It does not seek its own interests. Thank you for all who work to serve those who cannot fend for themselves. Strengthen those who have lost hope and confidence in their own value. Give us insight to speak the truth in love and to work for change that creates opportunities for those on the margins and respect for any who face discrimination. O oh God, your love is not quick-tempered. Thank you for every occasion when someone spared us from their anger. We pray for those who are filled with anger and for all around them who face or fear violence. Raise up advocates for children and elders who are abused and rescue those who are trapped in relationships that injure and harm. Oh God, your love bears all things. It never fails. We thank you for those we have loved in this life and who now dwell in the peace and joy of your presence. Let your comfort settle on those who are bereaved or lonely this day. We remember before you those with heavy burdens, many cares, much stress, and those who find too little comfort and help. Open our eyes to those in need around us and show us how to offer support and companionship for the sake of Christ, our friend and Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We all know what it's like to wake up from a frightening dream and think, wait a minute, was that real? And once we get a little more alert, we realize that it was just a dream, and we hopefully will fall back to sleep. <coughs> Psychologists say there is one type of dream that is nearly universal. Can you guess what it is? It's the dream of being unprepared for an exam. It's awful, isn't it? School children all over the world report having this dream, or should I say, nightmare. But that's what it is, it truly is. In this dream, you realize on the day of the exam that you never showed up for class. You missed the entire semester. Or the exam questions are written in a foreign language you don't recognize. Or you completely forgot to study the night before. Dr. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, studied these exam dreams and concluded that they are never about exams we have failed. Rather, he discovered that these dreams usually involve exams in which we did well. So he believed that exam dreams were actually our brain's way of reassuring us that we faced the challenge before, did well, and could do it again. I hope he's right. I suspect I'm not the only one who panics at the thought of facing a big challenge unprepared. And it helps us relate to the situation of Jeremiah the prophet in our scripture lesson for the day. Jeremiah was a young priest in a small settlement near Jerusalem when God spoke to him one day and called him to be a prophet to the nations. Nothing scary about that, is there? <laughs> Don't kid yourself. It's funny, but I've often said, I've heard others say, if God would just speak to me, if he would just tell me what I should do with my life, it would be so much easier. We all think that if God spoke to us in a clear and unmistakable way, we would feel instant relief and would obey instantly. But look at all the people God spoke to in the Bible. Very few responded with, sounds great, I'm on it. Thanks for the clear directions. Almost every person responded with fear, questions, or excuses. So let's not kid ourselves that we are so faithful or courageous to respond when God calls us to fulfill his purposes. Jeremiah responds like we probably would. Alas, sovereign Lord, which is another way of saying, oh no, I don't know how to speak, I'm too young, which seems like a reasonable excuse to us. No thank you, Lord, I'm not ready. I'm sure you meant to give this job to somebody else. It reminds me of a comment a manager once wrote in an employee evaluation. He's never been very successful at the evaluation. When opportunity knocks, he complains about the noise. Jeremiah wasn't exactly complaining. He just wasn't listening. All Jeremiah heard was responsibility. He didn't hear the reassurance. God never gives a responsibility without first giving, giving reassurance. God never calls someone without first comforting them. God never appoints someone without first anointing them. Look at the God's words in the beginning of this passage. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I hope you hear these words too, just as Jeremiah did, and plant them in your heart and mind. Because your life will never have the impact that God created you for unless you understand this truth. God made you for a purpose. That's the first, first truth we need to understand from Jeremiah's story. God made you for a purpose. In fact, when God tells Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart, the word used here literally means set apart for a sacred purpose or consecrated. You weren't just made for a purpose. You were made for a sacred purpose, for God's purposes. Dr. Robert Schuller, famous for coining the phrase possibility thinking, was once asked in an interview how he developed such a positive, optimistic outlook on life. He said he developed this attitude through his morning prayer time. Every morning he would pray, Dear Lord, lead me to the person you want to speak to through my life today. Amen. That's an interesting prayer. Dear Lord, lead me to the person you want to speak to through my life today. 
How could such a simple prayer change his whole outlook on life? Dr. Schuller says that this prayer caused him to see the people around him as opportunities for God's blessings. Because of this prayer, every interaction became an opportunity for God to speak through him. Don't misunderstand, he didn't assume he had all the answers. But the burden wasn't on him. He assumed that if he would do his part, God would work through him to bring some truth or love or mercy into that person's life. What would change about your life if you viewed every moment as a limitless opportunity to live for God? Every moment. The time you spend on the school bus or commuting each morning, the conversations in the locker room or the conference room or the band room or the, on social media. What would those moments look like if you knew God was working through you to change people's lives? Ephesians 2, chapter 10, verse 10 said, in the New Testament reads, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which were prepared in advance for us to do. Prepared in advance. God not only created us for good works, God prepared those good works for us in advance. God just didn't just make you for a purpose. God made you with a plan in mind. God made you for specific good works that were prepared in advance for you to do. There's nothing random or meaningless about your life. Every moment was created for God's sacred purposes. That's the first thing we need to understand from today's Bible passage. The second thing we need to understand from this passage is that in order to accomplish God's purposes, we must live without fear. Think what you could accomplish if you could live without fear. Pastor Peter J. Blackburn tells a story about his family's camping trip to a national park in Australia a few years ago. The Blackburns and their friends spread out and explored different hiking trails around their campsite. Soon Blackburn heard two of his sons calling for help. He looked up to see his sons and a friend had climbed a high rock ledge along one of the hiking trails, and now they weren't sure how to get down. Fortunately, the boys discovered a safe route on their own and soon rejoined the family at the campsite. Once they returned, Blackburn had to remind them of one of the rules of rock climbing. Never jump unless you can see where you're going to land. And before you climb to a higher peak, make sure you see a way back down. Well, that is great advice for rock climbers. That is not great advice for followers of Jesus Christ. God says, jump, and I will catch you. God says, climb out on the higher peak and trust that I will show you the way. Listen to God's words to Jeremiah. Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I sent you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. How many opportunities are lost to fear, particularly the fear of rejection? Personally, I've never heard of anyone dying of rejection. How many blessings wither and die in the face of our excuses? Fear shrinks our vision. Fear stunts our potential. Fear steals our internal, eternal impact. How? By making us doubt God's calling. Listen to God's words again. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Repeat to yourself three times a day or 30 times a day, I will not be afraid for God is with me and will rescue me. Then see what opportunities God opens up for you. Let me tell you about somebody who conquered her fear and, and, and is doing wondrous good in her community. After suffering through an abusive relationship, an addiction to alcohol, and a cancer diagnosis, Deborah Constance found success and stability as vice president of a major realty company in Los Angeles, California. In her role as vice president, she was also in charge of her company's philanthropic giving. As a result, she developed a heart for kids in disadvantaged, crime-plagued neighborhoods in South Central Los Angeles. Through her volunteer work with these kids, 
Deborah sensed that she had a larger mission than running a successful real estate company. When she shared this growing conviction with a friend, he asked her, what do you really want to do with your life? Without thinking, Deborah responded, all I really want to do is open a safe house for the children at Jefferson High School. Her friend answered, then do it. And then the panic set in. Deborah began listing all the reasons that she couldn't open a safe house for kids. She herself had dropped out of high school. It would cost too much money. She didn't have the education or the work experience. And Deborah's family friend looked her in the eye and said, you can do it and you must do it. That conversation led to the founding of a community center named A Place Called Home that serves hundreds of young people every day in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Los Angeles. The workers at a place called home offer counseling, academic tutoring, mentorships, vocational training, after-school programs in the arts, and various sports. They also provide college scholarships, job placement, and a safe hangout for kids and teens. How many lives have been changed? How many lives will be changed? Because Deborah Constance's friend challenged her with the words, you can do it, and you must do it. To accomplish God's purposes, we must live without fear. And the final thing we need to understand from the story of Jeremiah is that in order to accomplish God's purposes, we must trust God's plan. Doing great things for God begins with simple trust. that The one who has called us will not forsake us as we seek to follow his call. I was struck recently by some wise words written by finance blogger Bob Lotich, comparing God with professional quarterback Tom Brady. And no, he didn't say Brady can walk on water, although I'm sure some of his fans think he can. Here's what Lotich wrote. God loves throwing lead passes. I know we have at least one major football fan here this morning, but what does leading pass mean? God loves throwing leading passes. Lotus explains that a leading pass in football is when the quarterback throws a long pass not to where a receiver is, but to where a receiver is going. For a lead pass to work, the receiver runs ahead of the ball being thrown and trusts that the quarterback is going to throw it just to the right spot. Bob writes, with God, when you follow his principles, the results are almost always delayed. As in when he asks you and me to do something, we rarely see the results immediately. We have to keep doing what we know he's told us to do, running, and trusting that God will get us the results, the ball, somewhere downfield. If I were playing catch with NFL quarterback Tom Brady and he said, just start running and the ball will be there when you get there, I would trust him. He has seven Super Bowl championship rings that prove he can sufficiently get the ball to a receiver downfield. How much more can we trust God when he says, just start running. I'll take care of the rest. Whatever you're trusting him for today, says Bob Lodich, just keep running and trust that he's got it all worked out. I love Bob's conclusion. Whatever you are trusting God for today, just keep running and trust that he's got it all worked out. That's what Jeremiah learned to do. God didn't choose Jeremiah because of his outstanding skills and charisma. Look at the final verses from today's Bible passage. The Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. God's plan is not about you. It's not about me. It's about God working through us. As the Lord said to Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth. But God gives us a choice. What we give to God, he will use for his purposes. So what would happen if you gave everything to him? My friends, God gave, made you for a sacred purpose. You can't unhear that truth. Every moment you are alive is a sacred opportunity to do good works that God prepared in advance for you to do. The only obstacle standing between you and God's sacred purpose is your 
willingness. Will you give every part of your life to God? Will you refuse to let fear shrink your vision? If so, God can use you to bring hope and salvation to people who might never meet him any other way. Decide today to trust everything to God's purposes, and God will use you to make an eternal impact in others' lives. Amen.
God did not say that it would be easy to bring the good news to all people, but God did say that God would be with you. So go now in peace, walking humbly with God. Bring the good news of hope to all the people. Amen.